and I'm sure you can remember Baal Mini. And not all of them were considered at the time to be what we would now quote as evil. Similarly, there are many, many male deities, male gods that were worshipped from the very first civilizations to the present day. Now, if you consider the Christian tradition, of course, we consider God traditionally in the Christian model of being a masculine force. So the, the tradition of a masculine divinity is very, very long. Similarly, we have the worship of the feminine, the divine feminine. And a few weeks ago, in fact, one of the questions that was asked and considered was, where is the respect of the divine feminine? And in fact, it was a fair question, a question I don't think in hindsight I answered particularly well. There's a long tradition from Anana, Ishtar, Astarte, Athena, Venus. Venus and, of course, Luciferia. Even in Roman times, Lucifer was not just Lucifer the masculine, but Luciferia the feminine. Just as Satan or Saturn was Saturn and Saturnia the feminine. There was a recognition of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Now, up until recently, the covenant made no distinction of these. It simply identified a name that in the modern Western tradition is associated because of the homogenization, the, the Hollywoodization of our culture lumped in with the devil, Satan and all of this. But these names and these traditions were wholly separate and aren't simply one word, one being, one entity that have a long tradition. So the deeper issue is, is this. Just as there needs to be a deep respect and a justifiable respect to everyone's faith, that we never find ourselves isolating people based on their existing creed, colour, race, religion, there is a need to be absolutely crystal clear of traditions of divine masculine, divine feminine, the divine messengers, the many types of divine messengers that have been there throughout history. And the covenant needs to show that that is the energy that is coming together in forming treaties, not simply labelling things the Treaty of Lucifer because that is a provocative statement. And because of that, we are signalling that the present system it has no more power, no more authority to play the divide and conquer. They have no more authority. That is clear. But we must approach this, and I must approach this, with the greatest respect to each and every one of you, to those that listen and those that haven't yet even heard of Eucadia, so that in the future, no one can look at this and say, here's a treaty that was written and confirmed and people believe but where's the deeper treaty? Where's the treaty of the divine feminine? Why has this simply taken a controversial road and not seen maturity? So again, I find myself apologising and I make another apology that these matur maturities, these recognitions were not put into place. So there's been some evolutions in making sure that these things are clear. And what I'm referring to when you go to the covenant is that you'll see first and foremost that the, what was called the covenant of supreme patron and what I'm referring to to anyone who's on the call is one-heaven.org when you go to the home page click on the covenant and go to the index and and what I'm firstly referring to is the now the existence of the exordium which you'll see at the top of the index page which is the covenant of the supreme Supreme Patron. And then when you go to section IV, section 4 under power, you will see a framework, which by the way is not yet finished, <clears throat> just to show you that this is work in progress and this will be finished in the next few days. But under IV power is the Treaty of the Divine Masculine, Divine Feminine, Divine Messengers, Angels, Saints and Demons, Spirit, States, Sun, Earth and of course we left, we left out the Moon. Now, why are we doing this and why are these changes important? 
They're important because any kind of treaty and any kind of support in the covenant is not to create controversy, is not to create controversy with your upbringing, your faith and your belief, whether you are Christian, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, whether you're Hindu, Buddhist, wherever you come from, atheist, it is to respect that the covenant as an idea, as a thought form, represents an evolution of thinking. And no one should be turned off because they see a, a, a point of controversy. There is a, a line in the sand that we are drawing which says no one, no one, especially me, especially anyone in this world, has the right to claim to be a Messiah or some divine God or, or stand in front of you and the divine. That system is over. Just as a system that permits an elite group of families to perpetuate insane models, models of madness, in order to maintain control. That system is over. We have to grow up. We have to be mature. No one should be starving for food in Africa. No one should be dying of starvation. This, this, this madness that has pervaded our world for millennia has got to end. We have to grow up. It's time to grow up. Especially in the time and change, in the climate change that we are facing. Japan is not the first crisis we're going to face. We haven't even seen what is going to happen on the west coast of North America and the rest of the world. It's time to grow up. And it's not God punishing us, contrary to shock jocks and people behaving as idiots. It is all part of growing up and, and realising who and what we are. So with that and in mind of that, with the greatest respect, these changes are being put in place. And I hope for those that have found it troubling, you see that this is, again, a respect to you and respect to all faith. Now, moving on to that, because before we talk about the executive letter and before we talk about the, the remedy... I think it's important to, to cover another couple of things that we, we miss in our chats. When you lose your home, when you lose your children, when the system treats you as less than nothing, it is normal to be angry. It is right to be angry. But when we're angry, we often forget the things that we ourselves have contributed to. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of a couple of things before we move forward. First, first off, we are promoting honour and we're promoting competence because these are qualities that best reflect the golden rule, the, the one thread that is consistent across all faiths and all history and all culture. No one is above the law. No one is above the law. The law is for all. And the law means that if you do something wrong, then there is a consequence for that. Whether or not someone picks you up and says, hey, you've done something wrong. If you enter into an agreement, and that agreement is to do certain things, and you stop doing those certain things, then obviously you have a part to, to play if you have children and yet you also suffer a form of addiction, which many people do, I understand that. I'm not blaming you, but you have done something that has a consequence. If you speed in your car recklessly down the road, as much as you'd like to say, I do that free, you are risking other people's lives. There's a consequence for that. If you hit someone, if you injure someone, even if it's an accident, there's a consequence for that. If you live in a society and a society is providing services and that society needs a contribution 
and you don't provide the contribution, there's consequence for that. Now, I'm not justifying and supporting the existing system. Please, I'm not. I'm not justifying judges that don't listen to reason or prosecutors that put people away for 20 years because they are exposing corruption. I'm not doing that. I'm not supporting that. What I'm saying is it's not simply one way. Now, it's only when we stand up and look ourselves in the mirror and see our own faults and then choose to behave honourably and competently that we ultimately learn the lesson and go forward and it becomes irrelevant what they do because when we do that, we are healing our relationship with ourselves and our higher self, with ourselves and the divine, with ourselves and those people that we love. That's what we need to do first. That's what's important first. I know that when you've got a criminal case against you or they're coming after your home or they're doing any of those things against you, that obviously, obviously, you still have those issues to deal with. But let's not forget the obligations of being an honourable, competent member of society. And none of what we're doing with Eucadia is about a free ride or about welfare or about getting away with it. Far from it. It is about holding ourselves to a higher standard than the present system currently holds itself. And in doing so, shining an enormous mirror on behalf of ourselves and those that they have hurt, and more importantly, for the divine as well, for all those that have been tortured and hurt by that system. Shine a mirror to them, for them to see what they are not following in their own laws and in true law, in law that is clean and, and, and uncorrupted as we develop the canons. So I want to make that clear because... It's often presumed and assumed as we discuss these things and I want to make that clear that in no way are we saying, hey, I want to live in a world where I can do whatever I like. You can't live in a community and do whatever you like. Communities can only survive and the fact is that virtually everyone in the world lives in a community. Communities can only survive if there are competent people and people willing to contribute to that society. So our issue with taxes is not the idea of, of, of contributing to the community. In fact, in every aspect of the Acadia model, we say it is fundamental, fundamental that members of a community contribute to that community. And if someone's not willing to do that, then I'll tell you, I mean, they've got a problem. Because I don't think there's any community in the world that can be sustained if its members are not willing to contribute. It's fundamental. But our issue with taxes is how taxes are structured. Because the way taxes are structured, the wealthiest and the elite in our communities are the ones that have the most capacity and are not paying taxes. And the people who are paying the largest burden of taxes are the people that can least afford it. So our issue with tax is not the concept, but its application. It is unfair, it is designed and perverse, and it is wrong. That's our issue with taxes. Well, I hope it's your issue with taxes, certainly my issue with taxes. The issue with the courts, if someone injures someone else or hurts some property, then I don't have a problem about people being brought to account in the courts and actually standing there and admitting and there being some remedy. I have no problems because law is such that if something is done that is contrary to the rules of the society, then they have to be held account. My, my problem is with laws that protect pharmaceutical companies and render the growth of of herbs and the growth of food and the growth of naturally grown drugs, which our bodies have receptors for because it has been part of civilization from the very beginning, laws that make that illegal to me is utter madness. Laws that make money 
of crime is utter madness. 